So thank you very much for um, uh, the invitation to come and speak at uh, such a great gathering. I've been learning all sorts of wonderful things. Um, and I love lantern slides, and I'm going to talk about lantern slides, I promise, so I'll get right onto it. I've been told I only have 15 minutes, or you know, not to run over time, 15 or 20 minutes, so I'll try and uh, hurry. I want to talk today about not, well, the stuff, but also what we look at and why we see things the way we see them. Because I think when we talk about lantern slides, um, and when we talk about any kind of photographic material, we often forget what we're actually looking at. Um, and so I just want to talk very quickly um, about the way we view stuff and why I think it's important that we think about how we view things. So when you have a print in your hand, you view it by reflected light. When you have negatives or digital images, you, you view them by transmitted light. And when you have slideshows, you have projected light. And I think these three things have different qualities about them that we should take into consideration when we are talking about the materiality of images and how we're seeing our images. Um, it's become much very apparent to me that uh, uh, students have forgotten what reflected, images, reflected light images look like. Because when you hand them a print, they go, wow. That looks completely different. And it's the same sense of wonder that I think people used to have when they saw a projected light image because it was so rare. And um, because we see most things now by transmitted light, uh, we, we have a sort of sense that seeing prints by reflected light, or some people do, is a very new experience and a very interesting experience. So I think what I'm talking about, too, it has a lot to do with a, a kind of moving target. It has to do with you all or us as an audience and what we feel about things. So I want to bring emotion back into it. Maybe it's a, a, a nice dovetail to this morning's talk where we talk more about how we feel when we look at stuff. Um, so when we look at transmitted light images, I'm sorry, I was trying to get your new name right, Jeff, so I probably mangled it. <laughs> But I, I got close. I got science and media in it somehow. I did it. Is that it? Oh, good. I've, I managed it. Um, so when we, the, the very interesting thing about getting images on glass um, uh, was how wonderful people found it. This idea that the light was transmitted through it and they could look somehow through the negative in this case, um, negative by Sir John Herschel. And, um, and, and wonder at the sort of material qualities of those incredibly fine grains on top of glass. And, um, but they look incredibly different when you're looking at, for instance, um, a paper photograph. Um, and this is a sort of silver process, reprocess, a, a sort of newly made one. But it's also wet, because we took photographs of it in the darkroom, just as it came out of the water. But this is how a lot of people experienced um, photography is when you saw developed photography, you would see it first come up in the developer. So you'd see it when it was wet and underwater, it, or under developer, as the case may be. And I, I should have put in a picture under the safe light, because you would have also seen it orange and wet and underwater, which is another, another viewing experience, of course, um, that is very different. And different processes, of course, have their own viewing experiences in the darkroom. So when you would make a platinum print, for instance, you'd put it in the bottom of the tray and then you wash it very quickly because the whole print emerges more or less at the same time. When you have a printing out uh, process like the cyanotype, it sort of emerges in its yellows uh, in a certain way and you kind of peek at it from time to time and it gets darker and darker and then you wash it so it emerges um, in the water. But when you have a truly developed out process, you put it in and you rock the tray. How many still remember doing this? Yeah, good. So you rock, I, I, otherwise I'm describing something that you don't all, can't all imagine, but it, remember that feeling. You rock the tray and you rock the tray and the smell of fixer is quite strong and the <laughs> orange light, you can see what I'm doing. And that sense, that feeling of kind of rhythm while you're looking and having it emerge very slowly until, and you're watching it, aren't you, to think about when do I take it out of the developer? When do I take it? How, mo how long am I going to leave it in here? And then every once in a while in sort of hope at the bit that you didn't quite expose enough, you might give it a little bit of a rub here and there to try and help it along if you feel like that's going to do any good. It never really did, did it? You always had to go back and make another print. And then you would pull it out and put it in the stop and then you pull it out and then you'd put it in the fixer and you'd sit there and go, come on. 
done? Is it enough? Is it enough? That I, can I turn the light on now? Um, because you really, that sense of having it emerge into full light is really important. That sense of being in the darkroom going, or as we had to do in group darkrooms, uh, you know, put it in a tray and walk out, out of the darkroom so that you could see it by proper light, have a look at it, and then wet, and then take it back in and have it washed. These kind of viewing experiences seem to me to be really important and very, very intangible um, and something that we should consider when we talk about the materiality of lantern slides. Because the materiality of how we view it makes a difference when we think about how we experience it and what we think about what we're looking at. Um, and in this, um, of course, there's been some wonderful recent work about emotion and, uh, and photographs and looking. And I think it's very important that we remember how emotive photographs and the projected images really are. You're sitting in a dark room. Well, this room isn't dark, but we'll darken it down in a minute, I'm hoping. Can we? Can we make it dark? Maybe. Maybe. My, my lovely assistant will help in a moment. Um, and suddenly, this extremely bright image comes at you. You're sitting shoulder to shoulder. You can feel people sitting next to you, but you can't, maybe can't see them, but you can hear them slightly. And this kind of magic of being transformed, being brought into this world that is all very light, is very important. Um, when I was putting together this, oh, I see I've done a little, sorry, I've added a little bit to this lantern slide. When I was putting together this um, talk and I was thinking about the different kinds of materialities when we think about um, lantern slides, uh, and I want, by the way, to say thank you to the special collections at De Montfort University and Catherine Short and um, uh, Stephen Peachy who have helped me prepare, put these all together and have allowed me to loan out some slides from our collection. When you're thinking about how we experience photographs now. We experience lantern slides quite differently. That is, we mostly experience them a little bit like this, or perhaps actually look quite different than if you see them when they're projected in a lantern um, slide, in a, in a lantern itself. Lovely assistant. <laughs> we'll see what we can do here about this. And in part, that's because of how they're scanned. So I want you to notice the differences. Hopefully, we'll be able to... Oops. Is it... Oh, there's one in there? Um, no, oh, yours. okay. Can we do the black and white one then that I just saw? Because that one's a little bit on our side for a bit of trouble. <coughs> okay. So. This is a very different viewing experience, and what, well, what I would have to do to make it truly um, analytic, um, and I want to run a little experiment on you, is to change the light source, of course, because the light source is really important. It creates an entirely different feeling of what you're looking at. Um, and can I toggle back and forth between them? Yeah. So I want you to have a really good look at this, and then keep it in mind. Now, these are really bright, but I assume that some lanterns would have been even brighter. Um, when I did this experiment in Zurich, they had an extremely powerful lantern projector. And um, next to it, the digital image looked very pale and washed out um, because the lantern projector was so strong. Um, and the light source of it was, was incredibly bright and very white. Um, All right. So I want to talk about the quality of light when we view 
um, lantern slides. And also, um, and, and that kind of, I'm interested in that emotion, those different kinds of emotions and, and those different kinds of viewing experiences, because it seems to me that we see different things under different viewing circumstances. Different things jump out at us. Different things are highlighted. Um, it, one might look more linear, one might look slightly more blocky in black and white. One might look slightly more nostalgic. I think in this case, with this particular light source, it really does look very nostalgic. It has sort of a vignetting around the edges. Um, this looks more, the, the digital image looks more crisp. You can see both the image that's supposed to be projected and the notation all at the same time, which you can't do when you project um, from the lantern. So it's an entirely different way of thinking about and of viewing these images and of showing them in public. So I think people get a, a, a completely different sense of it. Okay, if we can shut that one down for a second. Thank you, Jeff. Um, what's really interesting though to me when, and I was thinking about this, is about the addition of color. Now, I'm, I've been very interested, um, uh, and very much like the last talk, I'm really interested in who's, who's behind it all. What kinds of people are we talking about when we talk about who is pushing what in the photographic industry? Photography is um, a fascinating and sort of malleable uh, material. And behind most of the developments in photography are not some unknown people, but some very, very well-known people. Or not people, but companies. Most of these companies are the aniline dye industry. Um, they are Agfra, they are, um, uh, uh, I'm going to forget all their names, Baya, um, Siba, all of these big companies. These were aniline dye companies. They turned into some of the largest photographic companies and the largest suppliers to photographic companies of one of the really important things, which was dyes that you use to make color photography. And this is a 1935, uh, as you can see, lantern slide from a slide lecture by Edwin Jelly, who's, who was a Kodak scientist. He combines here, this, the whole row of the whole series is mostly in um, an autochrome-like, a color direct positive uh, um, process. And I think he was buying competitors' uh, products, not autochrome itself. And he's, he's put them here next to each other to show the differences in what you get when you have monochromatic imaging and what you get in full color imaging. And this is a whole series of spectral analyses, crystalline analyses that are really quite beautiful and I can, I'd love to show you some more of them. But as you can see, they've been used heavily in a, in a lantern lecture, I suspect, for something to do with Ward Scientific. But here he's annotated them, very interestingly. I don't know how well those would show up because they haven't let me... Um, they haven't let me uh, put them in a lantern slide projector <laughs> and project them. So I'm quite interested in the pen notation, uh, especially on the, on the monochromatic image, because I'm not uh, quite sure what he intends students to see if he's projecting them, but they are quite, have quite clearly been used in a projector. They have numbers on them. They are part of a series. They have the dots on them to make sure you get them the right way around, and all those good things. So I don't quite know what's going on with those. Um, but the addition of color made me think a lot about the viewing experience of lantern slides. There's a whole series of keystone view slides. And I was in very interested in these companies because I think they control a lot about our response to colored lantern slides in the 20th century, especially. Um, partly because they look very different. So if you look at the color on an autochrome-like product or autochromes themselves, they have a very different color palette. Um, and I like these ones because it gives you a kind of rainbow of th all the different colors you could possibly get. Um, the Keystone View slides used a different coloring system, and they look quite different. The palette is quite different. Now, that palette can come from all sorts of things, and I want to talk about a little bit about how we feel when we view those different kinds of colors and how we feel about the view when it has been colored in a particular way. Um, so I want to run an experiment, and, and then, of course, there's Kodachrome. Um, and Kodachrome, of course, had a, had a very well-known palette. And I didn't bring a slide projector with you today because I couldn't actually find any bulbs for a carousel projector, although I tried my hardest in the last several weeks. We didn't have any working bulbs. Because I think, imagine, close your eyes for a moment, and I think most of you in the room looking around can still imagine what Kodachrome looks like projected in a Kodak slide carousel, along with the sound of the slide carousel. 
Kodak was notoriously warm, color balanced. Um, it was known for that. It sold its the, the whole notion of ideas and memories and family and balanced its film so that it would produce those kinds of warm, nostalgic, lovely images. Um, and these are patented and protected color palettes that are meant to evoke a particular sentiment um, from the audience. And I think when we think about how the projection, how the materiality of projection changes from the 19th century to the 20th century, the biggest change is that companies begin to have patented, known, saleable color palettes for our slideshows. And that certain people become aligned with certain types of images in certain palettes of colors, depending on what kind of mood you want to evoke. Um, and whether, we're, whether those people are then um, showing scientific slides, whether they're showing family snaps, whether they're showing geographical slides, the color palette behind those slides is influencing the audience all the time. But you can't control that. All you can control is which company you buy from. And even then, sometimes you don't have that much choice. Um, if you live near Rochester, New York, you sure weren't going to get anything but Kodachrome. Um, uh, so some, some films had a very particular and very well-known color balance. I see lots of you nodding, because of course, as a photographer, you knew these things. And you deployed a particular film to photograph particular things in order to evoke a, a, a an image of it that you felt was either most realistic or the one that matched your artistic sensibility. So um, Kodachrome was well known for reds and oranges. Ektachrome was known for its kind of blue balance. Fujichrome, very green, those intense greens. Verichrome was used a lot in the copy industry, especially for watercolors, because it picked up especially um, uh, pastels and those pinks and purples, very light colors very, very well that Kodachrome didn't reproduce particularly well. Um, and there are others. I just put these up as an example. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to run an experiment. And for this, I will need my lovely assistant. Um, because there are, in the special collections of uh, De Montfort University, we have about 60,000 lantern slides, um, give or take a few. And most of them came from the National Art Library at the v &A. I don't really know why they're all at De Montfort, um, but they are. <laughs> uh, in among them are some very interesting slides. And these particular ones, as you can see, are made at the Board of Tourist Industry. Um, they're made uh, to show, in this case, Tokyo and uh, the surrounding area quite attractively to any kind of visitor who might come. What's interesting is the material is quite telling. So these are, as you can see, not square. Uh, square is not, is not, is the standard in Britain, but it was, the rectangle was an American standard. And of course, in Japan, you would have gotten American manufactured goods to take your photographs. So they tell a kind of a story of that. They are all delicately hand colored, as you will see. I don't know that it's going to pick it up with that light source. Um, I, this one is actually in there. and about how we react or respond to seeing things projected in a particular kind of color. And I'm sort of hoping it works. <laughs> it's always terrible when you sort of hope it works, but you haven't been here to try. So all this kind of delicate hand coloring, it worked. What do you think? Yeah, in what way? Uh huh. You can definitely pick up the circle on the ice. So the <laughs> contrast, the co the gray and white and black contrast, comes up a little. The delicate coloring, so if you want to swap back, you can just slightly. Um, normally, when we pick up this 
um, slide. And when you hold it in your hand and look at it on a light box, everyone says, ooh, ah, oh, what a beautiful hand coloring job. It's gorgeous. And, but when you project it, it doesn't actually come across very well. It's not a very successful coloring job. And when we see those heavily painted slides, you know, the ones you look at and say, oh, I think somebody's let their 10-year-old loose on this lantern slide. I rather suspect that in the projection, it comes across quite differently, that these kind of delicate colorings are not wildly effective in producing a colorful slide, if, that's was, um, if that was at issue, um, if that's what you really, really wanted. And that the kind of delicately colored ones are still more of a kind of black and white experience, a, a, monochrom a slightly more monochromatic experience. Now, with I, d I haven't tested it. This is a very unscientific experiment because what I would really need is different light sources to see what happens when you use light source from the 1930s, which is when I suspect these are from, uh, interwar period is when I suspect they're from, but I don't have a lot of background on them, if anyone else does and has seen them because I suspect they were produced in many multiples, but I, don't, I haven't found any others. Um, and it, it will really pick up lines. So when I did this experiment with a bunch of art history slides, a Kodachrome next to a lantern slide next to a digital image, what was interesting is how linear the glass lantern slide was. It was a Manet. I thought it would be a good example because it really emphasized the lines that we are well known, that Manet's paintings are well known for. In the digital image, it, they receded a little bit. They receded back into the colors. Um, and it was an interesting viewing experience. It was for an art history audience. And they were interested to see how generations had been trained looking at different experiences of what that picture looks like. So when we're looking at lantern slides and when we're looking at the kind of results of what you have in your hand, this material object, in part, we have to think about what is it going to look like up here when you project it? What kinds of projectors are being used? Where are they from? Who makes the light bulbs? Um, how much voltage do you have? Because, of course, a viewing experience in Britain is very different from a viewing experience in the States, as is boiling your kettle with an electric tea kettle. <laughs> very different experience in the States. Um, and, and we have to think about ex all those kinds of interlinked <coughs> material, um, uh, manufacturing, electricity board uh, instances that will change how it is that the audience is going to receive those images. Um, and the point of this new research is going forward is to think really about um, viewing states. What do we feel like when we view things? We've talked a lot about how museums change how we handle materials, but we don't very often think about, well, when I'm looking at this image, what am I looking at it under? What would someone have received it what kind of light would they have received it under? How would they have viewed it? And what would it have looked like to them? What kind of details did they see in it that I don't see because I'm looking at it differently? And I think that's me on time. So I will stop.